slowly is working. There we go. Okay, and I'm Okay, and I'm So we had okay, about 18 I'm people sign up, so I want to give everyone some time to come in. Sure. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I am uh, happy to announce that we have a special guest from the Satanic Temple. Shalith Blythe, and we are Secular AZ, a 501c3 organization focused on protecting the Constitution and the separation of church and state for over a decade here in Arizona. And normally on Fridays, we give a legislative update of all the things that are happening at the Capitol, but as you probably already know, the past few weeks, very little legislative work is happening. Uh, it seems like the majority party members aren't on the same page when it comes to the budget. So they're still not allowing the minority party a seat at the table during these negotiations. So today we are going to hear from Minister Shalise Blythe. She has been a member of the Satanic Temple since 2014. And in 2016, she founded the TST Utah chapter, which is now called TST Utah Congregation. She served as a chapter head until her appointment to TST's senior advisory body, the International Council, and she served on the council from 2017 until 2019. And she's also served as the director of TSD's After School Satan Club campaign and is a longtime collaborator with TST's Gray Faction campaign. She was a co organizer for the Gray Faction's highly successful inaugural Moral Panics Conference, as well as the lead organizer for Ordination Council's inaugural Ministers Conference. And recently, she was the programming director for TST's inaugural Satan Con, which took place in Scottsdale. Uh, she is also a researcher, lesson writer, and a presenter for TST's ordination program. And in 2021, she became the first woman officially ordained as a minister of Satan by TST's satanic ministry. So all that said, thank you for being here. And we're going to talk today about reproductive rights, all the attacks that are uh, <laughs> coming from a lot of different directions on them, and the satanic temple's response. And if you have questions for Shalise, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, and I will pass those along to her at the end of her presentation. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen real quick. Um, all right, share screen. Um, okay, can you, uh, can you see that? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Okay. So um, again, uh, my name is Shalise Blythe. Um, I'm with the Satanic Temple, um, and today we'll be um, talking about our uh, religious reproductive rights. Um, and you know, you've heard my bi biography. I've been with the uh, Satanic Temple uh, since 2014 in various capacities. And uh, thank you very much to Secular AZ for asking me to speak today. So for today's presentation, um, just a quick overview. I'm going to go over what non-theistic Satanism is, just very basics. Um, also going over the, you know, the concept of what non-theistic religion is. Um, and uh, the you know, fact it's, it's not uncommon to have a non-theistic uh, religion, uh, especially being uh, recognized as, uh, I guess, legitimate for uh, um, you know, legal reasons. Um, also going over the Satanic Temple, um, our foundings, uh, and our ethos. And then we'll be talking about the Religious Reproductive Rights uh, Campaign um, overview and some of the ways in which we've been trying to assert our religious uh, rights, uh, especially when it comes to reproductive health. Um, so non-theistic Satanism, the basics. Um, what? So before I go into the specifics of the Satanic Temple and its activities, um, I'd like to first establish the foundational religious philosophy of Satanism. Uh, you know, history roots is a religious practice and identity. Um, so what is Satanism? Uh, Satanism is a non-theistic religious philosophy centered around the literary character of Satan as a Promethean hero. Uh, a hero villain who is um, who has done good, but only by performing an overreaching or rebellious act. You know, that's kind of the, the foundation of the Promethean myth. 
Um, the majority of, um, so the key term here is literary character. Uh, the majority of Satanists do not believe in Satan as a literal deity. Rather, um, Satan is a metaphorical representation of the eternal rebel um, best exemplified by uh, Milton and the other romantic Satanist uh, authors such as you know, Blake, Shelley, and, and Anatole France. Uh, Satan is also known throughout various cultures as the light bringer, uh, the adversary, bringer of knowledge, etc. So not only is Satan a literary symbol of rebellion against arbitrary authority, uh, it's also emblematic of personal liberation and the pursuit of knowledge. If you look at the history of Satan, you'll, you'll find that there are a lot of different interpretations of what Satan is, uh, whether it's a literal um, malevolent being that tempts humanity into sin and atrocity, or, or it could be more of an abstract idea of human adversaries. Satan represents many things to different people, but to us, if we look at the most widely known story of Satan being the angel that defies God's tyranny, um, you'll see that you know we're we're talking about you know the bringing of enlightenment to humanity, um, and Satan then becomes the ultimate representation of that rebellious human spirit that embraces outsider status and enlightenment era values such as knowledge by means of logic and evidence, uh, personal liberty, progress, et cetera. So when it comes to the Satanic Temple, um, we specifically find inspiration from Anatole France's book, Revolt of the Angels, um, when it comes to how we contextualize Satan as a symbol for our religious philosophy and identity. Um, I won't get into the entire book, um, and it's also important to note that we don't you know, have a Bible. Um, some people may be familiar with Satanism and that they think of um, uh, Anton LaVey, the Church of Satan, the Satanic Bible, um, uh, but you know, TST does doesn't have anything like that, but we do have canonical literature like Revolt of the Angels as an inspiration for our overall philosophy. Um, but you know, essentially, the story is about um, uh, this conversation that happens, uh, you know, happens between you know the narrator um, who is uh, an angel that was present during you know the rebellion, you know Lucifer's rebellion against God, and um, talks about how. Um, you know, during the heavenly wars and facing conquest, you know, Satan has a dream. God is defeated, Satan ascends the throne, and he is now essentially the new God. Um, but because of this, he wakes up in a cold sweat and he immediately tells his comrades what that dream means. And, um, you know, to quote from it, um, God conquered will become Satan. Satan conquering will become God. May the fates spare me this terrible lot. I love the hell which formed my genius. I love the earth where I have done some good. Now, thanks to us, the god of old is uh, dispossessed of his terrestrial empire, and every thinking being on this globe disdains him or knows him not. But what matter? Um, but what matter is it that men should be no longer submissive to God if the spirit of him is still in them? If they, like him, are jealous, violent, quarrelsome, and greedy, and the foes of the art uh, and are the foes of arts and beauty, what matter? What matter um, that they have rejected the ferocious demorg if they have not broken or uh, they uh, do not hearken to the friendly demons who teach all truths? As for ourselves, uh, celestial spirits, sublime demons, we have destroyed God, our tyrant, if in ourselves, and have destroyed ignorance and fear. So, um, you know, the, the, but, but really at the end of it, he says, we are conquered because we fail to understand that victory is a spirit. And that is, um, and that it is ourselves and in ourselves alone that we must attack and destroy God. So within TST, you'll hear victory is a spirit a lot. Our Satanism is based on this idea that we defeat God-like characteristics within ourselves, things like cruelty, ignorance, and fear by embracing satanic enlightenment, knowledge, liberty, progress, um, and we liberate ourselves from tyranny and instead we thrive. Um, so for us, even though we have elements of humanism and atheism, you know, we're, we're constantly asked, you know, why Satan? You know, why can't you call yourself anything else? Because, you know, the term Satan is, you know, it's icky. It's, you know, it's problematic or, or um, uh, you know, it just it makes us feel bad. Um, 
it's not something, um, you know, you know, why not do something less scary? Well, you know, because this is why, I mean, we're, we're talking about this iconic, uh, the figure that represents these things that we just went over. And so we can call ourselves anything else, you know, because nothing else so perfectly represents the spirit of our philosophy. Um, so uh, when we're talking about non-theistic religion, um, you know, really just kind of want to point this out because, you know, um, as I'm, you know, as I'm speaking to you all, um, you know, it's, it's really important to understand that, you know, one of the things we run into all the time is, well, if you don't believe in a literal deity, how are you a religion? How are you a legitimate religion? Well, um, you know, non-theistic religion does exist. Um, it's existed prior to even Satanism, uh, you know, religion without God. Um, and, uh, you know, examples are Jainism, certain types of Buddhism, classical Confucianism, humanistic Judaism, and, you know, and then also you have contemporary Satanism. Now, the only thing you'll notice on that list that anybody would question the validity of would be Satanism. Everyone else, you know, accepts the fact that these other, you know, religious groups, these religious identities, um, are legitimate. There's almost no question. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, probably time having um, existed for, um, you know, a long time, right? Um, but just because, you know, Satanism as a religious philosophy and practice is, you know, fairly modern when it comes to, you know, the timeline of humanity, uh, doesn't make us less legitimate. Um, you know, religion without God is possible. It has existed for a long time, and we do not have to believe in a God to have, you know, legitimate religious uh, beliefs um, and claim to um, the protections that uh, are afforded to us under religious liberty. Um, so, you know, the recent, uh, recently, you know, Supreme Court decisions have elevated religious liberty above all human rights. I mean, that is the, um, that is the unfortunate reality that, that we live under. And I say unfortunate reality because it's used mainly as a, as a weapon instead of something that is used to protect, uh, you know, religious minorities. Um, you'll find that a lot of religious protections are to benefit the majority and not the minority. But, um, still, technically, these laws exist, so we as a religious minority should, um, you know, uh, do everything we can to make sure that our religious liberty is protected under that which uh, is afforded to us, especially with the Supreme Court decisions coming out. Um, you know, we Satanists want our religious liberty respected as much as that of any adherent to any power majority face. And, you know, to try and force a theistic interpretation of religion is to hold superstition as more legitimate than logical and reasoned beliefs. And that's, you know, one of the cornerstones of why we, um, you know, fight as hard as we do in, uh, is because we don't feel that superstitious belief um, should be respected more than non, um, you know, the non-theistic belief. And that also pertains to people that consider themselves um, atheists or agnostic or those that um, do not claim um, any kind of theistic belief, but just because they don't claim to have theistic belief doesn't mean they don't have the same rights and protections as those who do. So that's why, you know, embracing non-theistic belief is really important, not only for those who are, you know, people like Satanists, but also for others um, that don't believe in God. Um, so, uh, just to kind of go over, um, you know, uh, the legalities, um, the U.S. federal government has recognized Satanism as practiced by TST as a legitimate religion. Uh, in April 25th, 2019, the IRS did recognize us as a church, and then in February 26, 2020, uh, the U.S. District Court uh, confirmed our um, Satanism as a legitimate, legitimate religion, which actually had to do with the um, uh, the uh, the Scottsdale case. Um, I don't know if any of you heard about that, but you know our uh, our group tried to give an invocation uh, before the Scottsdale City Council um, that went to lawsuit because they approved us and then decided they weren't going to approve us and you know told us in so many words to go fuck ourselves. And, uh, you know, um, that case was um, ultimately um, determined that, you know, Scottsdale, uh, you know, essentially Scottsdale got away with it based on technicalities, but what the one thing we did get out of that court decision was, you know, this judge, you know, uh, you know, confirming that we are a legitimate religion and that's no longer part of the question as to whether or not we are able to participate in the public forum. So that was a pretty big, that was a pretty big deal, uh, the first of its kind, um, you know, especially for, for Satanism. And so because of that, um, you know, it kind of helps us to 
stop uh, having to constantly answer the question all the time of, you know, is, is Satanism a legitimate religious identity? And uh, is that legitimacy um, always going to be used against us uh, for um, discrimination purposes? Uh, so the Satanic Temple was uh, founded in 2013 by Malcolm Jerry and Lucian Greaves. Um, you know, we consider ourselves an evolution of non-theistic Satanism. Uh, we have the seven tenets. Uh, we don't have any elements of Midas Rite or Randian philosophy as seen in the Church of Satan. Um, the Church of Satan was founded in, 19, in the 1960s by Anton LaVey. Uh, they have, uh, they were actually the first group to uh, practice religious Satanism. Um, and uh, still around today, obviously they exist very differently from us, but, um, you know, we've kind of taken the, uh, you know, inspiration from those who came before us and acknowledge that, you know, without Anton LaVey, we would not exist. Um, but, you know, we find ourselves being the, the evolution of thought, you know, there's certain things in uh, COS philosophy that, you know, we deem to not be uh, um, valid or kind of, it kind of goes beyond, you know, what we now understand of the world. So, um, again, you know, we see Satan as a Promethean hero and a symbol for personal liberation, pursuit of knowledge, and rebellion against arbitrary authority. Uh, Revolt of the Angels by Anatole France is considered our canon uh, canonical literature, which I had quoted previously. Uh, we have no Bibles. Um, don't intend on, on having any, um, uh, you know, we, we find inspiration from literature, not, we don't, you know, need a Bible for those purposes. Uh, so the seven fundamental tenets, um, I'll go over them very briefly. Um, you know, one should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. The struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. One uh, that so that's one of the ones that we utilize a lot uh, when it comes to uh, you know especially the topic we're talking about today, which is reproductive rights. Uh, but the foundational one here is uh, number three, one's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. Uh, you will hear that um, a lot when we talk about um, you know our, our right to our reproductive health. Uh, the freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend, the willful and the, the willful and justly to willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another's to forego one's own. Belief should conform to one's best scientific understanding of the world. One should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit one's belief. Um, that's, again, another tenet that we use um, when it comes to, uh, you know, this, um, you know, reproductive rights. People are fallible. Um, if one makes a mistake, one should do one's best to rectify it and resolve any harm that might have been caused. Um, and to tie it all together, uh, tenet seven, every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always uh, prevail over the written or spoken word. Um, so, you know, these tenets are the foundation of, of uh, our beliefs, and um, we uh, don't ever see them as existing solely outside of the other. They're uh, meant to be seen as, as a collective, you know, they don't exist outside of one another. So we, we kind of take them all and, uh, you know, round out our philosophy of life and how we practice our Satanism based on all of them together. So what we do, um, so we are often accused by a lot of people, um, whether they've been a part of TST no longer, or they just don't understand who we are um, as being trolling activist group. Um, this has been a concept that has been around since our inception. And, um, you know, um, a lot of it has to do with us having a bit of a sense of humor about certain things. Obviously with reproductive rights, there's not a lot of humor one can find, especially uh, now, um, you know, in, in 2022. But, um, you know, a lot of the activism we engage in can either be, you know, the most serious of, of um, you know, we, we take it very seriously or we have fun with it. So because of that, uh, because we feel like we don't have to be totally serious about all things all the time, um, people just think we're trolls. Um, and, you know, and then the activism we engage in is just kind of uh, whimsical. It's, it's just a, doesn't really have a point. But, um, you know, our campaigns that we engage in um, are very narrowly focused. They have a point. Um, they have, um, they're not just done because we want to, you know, do them, especially putting all the, uh, the, financial backing behind what activism requires, all the volunteers, all of the all the things that go into our activism, which is not cheap, nor is it easy to find, you know, people to do the work. Um, you don't do that willy nilly, it has to have a point. And our activism is guided by our religious philosophy, it's guided by our principles. And, um, 
you know, we, we aim to preserve the separation of church and state. Um, we demand that our right to equitable representation in public life. And uh, we also, our activism also uh, is targeted to the protection of our religious liberty as Satanists. So activism always has a point. It's never done just because. Um, and, you know, it's within the scope and focus of, you know, us as religious Satanists. So, um, you know, TSD is, we are Satanists who sometimes engage in tightly focused mission specific activism, uh, but we do not, uh, we are not a political activist group that has um, overcomplicated its mission by picking a, a divisive name. Um, you know, it's, you know, it, it, there's the sincerity of belief, sincerity of identity um, that goes behind everything we do and who we are. So to kind of talk on what we what we do um, and, and the point of us having a conversation today, um, we have many, many um, campaigns um, that relate to us as Satanists. Um, and you can always go to the satanictemple.com, look for campaigns, and you can see everything we do, like after, state, after school Satan Club, Gray Faction, Protect Children Project, Sober Faction, all those things. But we're here today to talk about religious reproductive rights. So um, reproductive decisions um, uh, are in line with our religious tenets of bodily autonomy and acting in accordance with best scientific evidence. Um, we religiously object to many of the restrictions that states have enacted that interfere with abortion access, as well as other related issues that affect our members' religious rights. Um, and uh, I also put the satanictemple.com slash pages slash RR campaigns um, so you can kind of get a little bit more um, information, more specifics about all the various things that we do related to reproductive rights. Um, I won't be going over every single one of them, um, just kind of the, the overall scope of scope of things. So to highlight why we are talking about this um, from a religious perspective as opposed to us um, talking about this from a perspective of you know get your religion out of my get your religion out of my out of my doctor's office um, I think it's really important to point out especially considering we're talking about this post um, the leaked uh, decision uh, from the Supreme Court that will uh, nullify Roe v Wade is that Roe v. Wade um, is not necessarily, it actually doesn't talk about abortion, really. Um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a ruling that said, you know, abortion is legal. Um, the, the ruling had to do with privacy. Um, it had everything to do with privacy. And that was, and, um, you know, that was strategic. Um, and so when we talk about um, you know, the, the dissolution, you know, the dissolution of not only Roe v. Wade, but this also pertains to Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, we're losing our rights to privacy. We're losing our rights to our ability to make, uh, the, not only private decisions, um, in our medical offices, but also in the privacy of our homes. And what, um, what our legal system has made very clear, whether that's, uh, you know, state judges, federal judges, or the Supreme Court, is that one's religious rights take um, precedent over every other rights. I mean, you know, and this is obviously an affront um, uh, that has been placed upon us by, uh, uh, you know, a very uh, one group that wants to have their, um, you know, religious uh, viewpoints taking precedent over everybody else's viewpoints, whether they're religious or not, um, and their beliefs are going to be the ones that are um, the foundations of all of the rest of our rights being taken away because they conflict with their religious beliefs. So because we live in a world where things like RIFRA um, the Establishment Clause uh, protects religious practices and beliefs from government interference. Um, we can no longer we can no longer use our inherent rights and all of our sound arguments of the right to privacy uh, when it comes to um, reclaiming or um, fighting against uh, you know reproductive health restrictions. Um, the only thing we have left really is our religious freedom. So. Um, because states uh, enact things like RIFRA, you know, we base our, we base our, I guess, our legal strategy on, on the fact that, you know, the, the access to medical care um, is in line with our religious beliefs and that those religious beliefs uh, are to be respected. 
and no state law or federal law should interfere with our ability to practice our religion. Um, so, you know, you got federal law, which is going to be the thing that, ha you know, it is everything is going to go back to the states, um, essentially, is, is what uh, the Supreme Court is going to determine and, and, you know, will take place here in like a month or so. Um, state laws governing abortions commonly serve no medical purpose and do not result in better health outcomes. Therefore, they unlawfully hinder access to um, satanic abortion ritual, which we'll, we'll uh, talk about. Um, so satanic abortion ritual. Wow, that sounds scary, right? Um, so the satanic abortion ritual exempts TST members from enduring medically unnecessary and unscientific uh, regulations when seeking to terminate a pregnancy. This ritual involves the recitation of two of our tenants and a personal affirmation that is ceremoniously intertwined with the abortion. So this can be intertwined with um, a pill, could be a medical, uh, you know, a DNC. It could be, it can be, you know, any form of abortion that exists. When you are making the decision to terminate a pregnancy, you can perform this ritual, which again is just um, recitation of tenets and a personal affirmation uh, that you do before and after the, you know, the, the procedure or the intake of the, the pill or whatever the case may be. Um, now, it's really important to note um, that when we're talking about our religious abortion ritual, that um, it is not a requirement of Satanism. It is not a requirement of the Satanic Temple that you engage in this ritual um, to uh, practice your religion. It's not a requirement. And, you know, Satanists will tell you that they actually have various views on the topic of abortion, meaning that, you know, uh, respecting one's respecting one's um, you know, right to make decisions about their bodies um, doesn't mean that they would make that decision for themselves. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're all unified under this idea that, um, you know, we respect people's privacy and their decision to make the decision for themselves, even if it's not a decision we would make for ourselves in any given situation. But um, for those who do make that decision, um, we have, you know, offered this ritual as a way for them to, um, you know, uh, take the shame and guilt and um, any, any negative connotation to one's medical decisions away from them instead of firm their right to uh, make that decision for themselves. So because we are a federally recognized religion, uh, the Satanic Temple utilizes RIFRA and actually the Hobby Lobby uh, precedent to protect its members from unnecessary abortion regulations that inhibit their religious practices and force them to violate their deeply held beliefs. Uh, these restrictions come in a myriad of different ways. We're talking about things like uh, mandatory waiting periods. We're talking about um, uh, having to sit with state mandated propaganda that is full of scientifically invalid um, information that is meant to not only give you false information about, um, about this decision, about this procedure, um, but also try to instill guilt and shame in you for making that decision for yourself. Um, and uh, there's also um, laws that are written where doctors themselves are being forced to um, say certain things prior to, um, you know, either giving a pill or, or performing the abortion procedure um, that they know to be medically inaccurate. But if they do not do that, they'd be breaking the law and could be, you know, in, in face jail time. So they are being forced by state laws to give patients medically unnecessary and, and invalid information prior to that. Um, and so we, um, knowing that these things um, go against, you know, our tenets of not only uh, uh, bodily autonomy, but also going against our beliefs and basing our beliefs on the best scientific evidence available, um, being forced, um, having those forced upon us is a violation of our religious practice and our uh, religious beliefs. And uh, we consider ourselves exempt from those because they are a violation of our ability to practice our, our faith. Um, so I kind of want to just go over a couple of various things that TST also does in tandem with uh, protecting our, um, our members' uh, right to um, have an abortion, uh, engage in the uh, uh, religious abortion ritual. Um, there are certain things we do, such as we provide these, uh, these flyers. 
for crisis pregnancy centers, these uh, centers disguise themselves as abortion clinics to attract people who are dealing with unplanned or unwanted pregnancies. They often provide misinformation and promote a religious agenda to dissuade people from seeking abortion services. Sometimes they will actually try to um, get people to come back and wait and wait and wait until uh, a certain time has passed and the person can no longer attain an abortion based off of uh, state laws, like a six week abortion ban. They will, they will engage in those practices so that it becomes then legally un untenable for someone to obtain an abortion. So this is what they do. Um, so we've created flyers that disclose these facts where volunteers can distribute outside these big clinics. Um, and uh, um, they're, they're found on our website. You can download them and um, share as you please. Um, there's also the informed consent database. Um, this is a comprehensive guide to um, the informed consent statutes per state. Again, this relates to, um, you know, when you're uh, needing a medical procedure, you need to, you know, have complete informed consent and that informed consent should um, not be giving you any information that is incorrect and valid or meant to dissuade. Um, so this directly, uh, sorry, this directory um, addresses each state's abortion restrictions regarding the informed consent process for pregnancy termination procedures. Um, many states have enacted um, these statutes that interfere with Tuesday's religious beliefs um, by requiring unnecessary prerequisite procedures and forcing Satanists to accept unscientific arbitrary languages before they are allowed to undergo an abortion. So things like this could be, um, you know, the doctor being forced to tell somebody that an abortion is reversible. That is something that uh, some doctors are required to tell a patient, even though it's untrue. Um, there's also waiting periods um, that um, are justified by being given state mandated, mandated propaganda materials. Um, that uh, we feel we are exempt from because again, they, you know, that they're full, they're uh, full of information that is uh, medically inaccurate um, and is also meant to guilt and shame is also presenting um, this uh, from a, um, a theistic point of view or uh, the view that life begins at conception. Um, and so because those materials are unnecessary for us and they actually go against our religious beliefs, um, we are not required to sit with them for mandatory waiting periods and thus we should be exempt from all of that. So um, it's a really great database, really comprehensive. It breaks it down state by state um, and you can find more at uh, informed consent and you can actually view the database um, and all of the laws surrounding it. So if you're confused as to what your rights are um, and what you'll be uh, subjected to as anybody, whether you're Satanist or not, um, you can go to this database. Um, it's, it's, uh, they did a really good job with that. Uh, the other thing is a uh, fetal burial rule. So um, in both in Indiana and Arkansas, um, and th there may be more states now, especially since a lot of these um, states have trigger laws. So when Roe v. Wade is, is uh, struck down, um, a lot of these will go into effect. But uh, as of right now, Indiana and Arkansas have these um, laws requiring that healthcare facilities um, bury or cremate fetal remains from spontaneous or induced abortions or ectopic pregnancies, regardless of the patient's wishes. Um, and what this does is essentially, um, instead of treating a medical procedure the way you normally would, where if you excise, you know, tissue from the body, you would treat it like medical waste and you would dispose of it as medical waste as per procedure, as per standard procedures, um, you would have to uh, engage in some kind of a, a, a cremation or burial um, that is reserved for, um, you know, like religious practices or, you know, you know, you, you bury, um, you, you bury people, um, uh, you know, and so it's uh, from from a lot of standpoints, it's uh, treating fetal tissue as a decedent. And because of that, uh, forcing us to see this tissue as something that it's not, you know, against our religious views and our understanding of science. And um, that is a violation of our, our religious practice. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we assert that it's a religious right to treat human tissue as medical waste um, because that's, that's, you know, what science says and, and that's what medicine says. All right, so um, that's kind of the end of that. Um, thank you very much for having me here um, and letting me discuss these things. Um, I know that it's a very broad overview, so I am more than happy to take any specific questions, uh, not only pertaining to religious reproductive rights or anything else related to the Satanic Temple. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a couple questions that came in while you were speaking. Uh, the first one, a major mistake of the pro-choice movement has been in ceding ground in small steps, Medicaid, red states, et cetera. 
and relying on court cases to defend abortion rights. I see the same mistakes with the secular movement, although it's hard to do grassroots organizing with non-theists in the best of times. Now that SCOTUS is tearing up the remnants of the wall of separation, what can the secular movement try to do better? Um, <laughs> it's a big question. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a really hard question because, you know, at the, at the heart of that is the unfortunate truth that, um, and it's actually something that Satanic Temple runs into all the time, no matter what the court case is, whether we're talking about our right to give invocations or our right to um, have, you know, medical procedures. Um, the law can be as it's written, whether it's a good law or not. Um, and those laws are interpreted by judges that um, may or may not bring their, um, their biases and their own personal beliefs um, into the judgments. Now, we could have very sound legal defenses um, and, you know, uh, you know, cases that say, yeah, our rights were violated uh, or these these laws violate our our rights. And, um, you know, we should be, uh, you know, they, they should rule in our favor, whatever the case is. But um, what TST is finding in this is that that's not always going to be the case. They're always going to they're always going to find some way to, um, you know, some technicality, some, you know, make some weird ass interpretation of something that. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Am I still there? You are. You're still here. Oh, OK. Sorry. Something weird happened with my Zoom. Anyway, uh, apologies. Um, so they're always going to find some way to. Um, kind of get around and, and to, um, you know, find, find in the favor of the oppressor, right? Um, so that's, that, that's, that's the unfortunate thing. And um, so, yeah, you, you really can't, I mean, you know, people make the mistake of, of seeing um, these judgments and these rulings as, um, well, if the court says this, then obviously you don't know what you're doing. We actually hear that a lot um, because, you know, all of the cases that we've that we've dealt with, whether it comes to reproductive rights or whether it comes to invocations or any anything we, we tackle um, in legality. I mean, we always really do have the law on our side. We really do. If you look at if you look at legal theory and if you look at how you know the laws are written, um, it should be a shoe in. It should be like a, a you know, a shut, you know, a, you know, um, Chuck Lowe's case. But um, that's not what we're finding. We are we're finding um, and, you know, essentially proving that the court system and, you know, the judges um, are going to find any any way possible to um, use their own biases and use their misunderstanding of who we are to uh, rule against us. Um, even to the point of asking us questions about, you know, questions that they would never ask somebody else. So a really good example is, um, you know, when it comes to these court cases, you know, with, with the religious abortion ritual, they'll ask us things like, well, where exactly in your religious text or philosophy does it say that abortion is required? And you would never ask that of anyone else. I mean, they come out with these, so their justification for ruling against us is because, well, where in your religious text does it very specifically say this thing? And you would never hear them ask that particular question to anybody else, to a Christian, you know, to most people who, you know, claim to be something and have actually never read their own text, their own religious text, you know. Um, so these are the kind of things we're constantly dealing with. And I think in the secular community, that's also going to be an issue where, um, you know, you know, if you're if you're battling something, you do have the law on your side. That doesn't necessarily mean that the law is going to be on your side. Um, and I I don't really know an answer to that. I think that would actually be a really good question for um, maybe like a, a lawyer um, or somebody who's more familiar with the with the legal process, like the actual ins and out and the, the nitty gritty of the, the legal process. Because I mean, outside of this, um, you know, I've not seen much work, you know, I mean, I mean, unless you're, unless you're going to become a part of the system, meaning if, if you're somebody who is, um, 
if, if you see if you see the rot and if you see if you see the if you see the things going on you're seeing the coordinated effort for you know those who are intending to oppress and take our rights away you know they're the ones running for the local boards they're the ones running for local government um, that's how they're that's how they're doing it so I mean if you can't rely on the court system, the legal system, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, put yourself in a position where you can actually make change. And that's, you know, within these, you know, um, you know, running for these seats, running, you know, running for these offices, you know, being a part of it. So you can try and essentially dismantle these efforts from within because, I mean, they've already put up, uh, put us in a position where, you know, from the outside, no matter how many marches, no matter how many rallies, it's not going to do anything because they're, they're sitting on the ivory throne. They don't have to listen to you. And, um, you know, they've already orchestrated things in a way where they don't even have to legally listen to you anymore. So, um, you know, I guess I would say to the secular community, instead of, relying on things uh, instead of relying on on others instead of relying on the system to be just make the justice yourself and you know you kind of have to do that within the you know you, you kind of have to you know become a part of that system to help dismantle it that's my only that's really kind of the only thing i've been able to come up with because everything else is just like oh shit you know <laughs> well i mean and that is what TST has done. And I guess that leads into the next question. Um, and there may not be an answer to this quite yet, but how will TST respond if when Roe is overturned? And I don't know if there are plans. Will there be a legal response? Can you talk about that? Is something in the works? Because we all are pretty sure it's coming very soon. So. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming. I mean, there's, there's no getting around it. Um, here it uh so as far as TST's response, um the only thing we can do is um you know when I when I when I said earlier that because the, the, because this is this is focusing on uh, privacy rights this is something I I don't actually hear um, a lot of people talk about but I think it's really important to point out that these cases that are being overturned and uh, these things that are being given, pardon me, back to the state is the, is the issue and the rights of privacy. And um, this isn't just going to be about abortion. This is gonna be your right to privacy and all sorts of manners and all sorts of aspects of your life. This is going to be the privacy you have to love the people that you love. This is going to be an issue of the people you decide to marry. This is going to be, a, you know, uh, your right to medical care. If you're a trans person, for example, um, it'll come down to whether or not your right to exist as somebody who is not a white cis uh, conservative male um, is going to become a felony. And the thing, and the thing about these laws, you know, they're, they're turning these things. I mean, I mean, the laws that are being proposed, the things that are being said by by the various legislators, by the various people in you know in these um, positions of power, is they're absolutely intent on making our existence a felony. And you know what felons can't do? They can't vote. They don't get a voice anymore. And that means that they they're not able to, you know, uh, wield the only power we have left, which is which is the vote or, you know, I, you know, and, and and they're even starting to work on that even prior to Roe. I mean, you know, with all the gerrymandering and everything happening like, yeah, th those rights are already like just being completely wiped out and it's only going to get worse from here. So um, it's. Um, so when it comes to what TST is planning on doing, I mean, we were only really all we can do is utilize the only remaining right we have, which is our right to our religious freedom. Um, and the focus of our efforts is a way to protect our religious freedom. And unfortunately, that takes a long time. Um, the legal system uh, is overwhelmed, overpacked. There's a lot going on. Um, you could start a case and maybe not even have any hearings on it for months or years. Um, it's not an easy process. It takes years. Um, it's not a quick, you know, we, 
what we're not doing is not offering quick fixes. Uh, we're not offering or promising anybody that, you know, if they are a member of the Satanic Temple, they immediately have um, access to uh, their their medical right or their, you know, uh, like, you know, abortion um, just because they're a member of TST. That's not how that works. Um, there's a there's a lot that we can't offer in that regard, you know, and it and it and it's disheartening because I know um, right now and something I personally feel as somebody who's who you know being being a queer um, being a queer individual with a with a unfortunately still have my uterus right now, um, you know, this this deeply impacts and affects me, and I'm absolutely terrified. And, um, but I also understand that just because, you know, I belong, because I'm a Satanist, I belong to the, the Satanic temple. And, you know, in theory, my rights, uh, my religious rights should never be impeded. That doesn't mean that's not ever going to be the case. And so what we're offering, what we're doing is continuing to fight anyway. I mean, you know, we talk about, we talk, we talk about Satan as this um, iconic figure that, you know, is basically facing insurmountable odds and just does it anyway, even in the face of something that seems absolutely like unable to be defeated. If you don't do something, then you can't, you know, then, you know, we're, we're doing, we're trying, we're doing something. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's a lot more than a lot of other people, you know, can or will do. Um, so, you know, what we're doing is just continuing the fight. We're continuing everything we can to try and get somewhere. And we may not see the results of that effort in our lifetimes. Um, I've already come to peace with the fact that, you know, we could possibly do something, set precedent, or maybe, you know, change things via our, our legal efforts. It might start something, but that might actually not come to any kind of fruition or benefit to ourselves or others, you know, maybe after I'm long gone. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not still worth it. Um, because, you know, again, the system is so rigged um, and it is so set up to benefit, you know, one over the other that it's going to take as, as long as it took to put those things into place, it's going to take that long or more to completely dismantle it. And so, you know, we're doing our part for our members um, as best as we can. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that our congregations are doing to help support people, um, uh, their, mem you know, their membership, uh, you know, the, the, the satanic community in general, whether that's like, hey, I live in a state where this won't, this won't impact you. So if you need a place to stay, if you need help getting here, if you need anything, um, you know, do this, like they're, they're setting up funds, they're setting up support networks, um, it, it really is, um, the TST community is really banding together to try and do everything they can to support people that need these things, uh, that are going to need these things in a way that like the, the legal efforts won't be able to do, but in tandem, it's, you know, it, you can do, you can do two things at once, right? So, um, you know, trying to provide that support system while also trying to fight the bigger fight. Um, so that's, that's about as much as I know is what we're doing. And, you know, we're still going to continue to, you know, fundraise for the legal efforts because lawyers are very expensive. Filing uh, any kind of legal documents is very expensive. So we do have, you know, we do have a, a place where people, you know, can donate to that effort. Um, so we're going to continue doing it. Um, whether or not we're going to be successful, it really is just kind of determined on a lot of the factors we already talked about, which is going to be used against us in, in all sorts of ways. So. I don't mean that to sound terribly bleak, but it's, it's a little, it's a little bleak, a little. Well, it's feeling, it's feeling bleak, I think, yeah. right now, um, yeah. but appreciate the efforts that are ongoing. Um, a question that you just answered a little bit, but does TST have periodic congregate religious services like many other religions? Yeah, we do actually. So um, we have what's called Temple Tuesdays. Um, so we, we have a minister program uh, where we ordain ministers and um, via a virtual estate, um, we have ministers who lead services every Tuesday, actually every Tuesday and uh, Saturday. Uh, uh, the Saturday one um, kind of benefits because we're all over the world. Um, so Tuesday, um, you know, the it's like at nine o'clock Eastern. So a lot of people, let's say in, in the Americas are able to 
are able to attend. But for those in other time zones and other countries, um, it's a little untenable. So we started the weekend services for people that, you know, don't want to try and attend a service at like two o'clock in the morning or, or something like that. So yeah, we have uh, Tuesdays and Saturdays. And um, uh, it's uh, the Satanic Estate um, and uh, just religious services. And so not only do we do those live each week, um, we uh, record them and we archive them as well. So um, you, know, you can go through the archive and see other services that have been done in the past um, as well. And it gets updated like every week or two or something like that. So yeah. Great. Um... One final question for you. Can you tell us a little bit about the After School Satan Club, how that came to be, how it works, and if you have time, um, a little bit about the lawsuit that came after this, the After School Satan Club was rejected from the school in Pennsylvania? Um, oh, After School Satan Club. Oh, my baby. Um, yeah, so the After School Satan Club was... Um, something that was started to be something that would complement and contrast currently existing things like the Good News Clubs, um, which are uh, evangelical indoctrination clubs that, are, that take place uh, after hours um, at the schools. Um, and this, is made, this was made possible by the Supreme Court. There was a case uh, in New York, it was uh, Mil uh, Good News Clubs versus Milford Schools. Um, uh, you know, per pertaining to um, the fact that, you know, the, the school board or not the school board, the, the district denied good news clubs because they're like, no, separation church and state, we're not going to have it. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, which was uh, the decision was uh, authored by uh, Justice Thomas, um, essentially ruled that uh, public schools are a, are a limited public forum. And because of that, you cannot discriminate uh, against people, um, you know, you cannot discriminate against the public that wants to utilize the, uh, you know, the, the, the public, uh, the forum or, you know, so you actually enter into a, a, a lease agreement with the school. So they're not, these aren't endorsed by the, um, these clubs aren't endorsed by the the schools, they're not endorsed by the districts. You're essentially engaging in a, um, a, a lease, a, a space lease uh, rental with them. Um, so after that decision, Good News Clubs exploded. Um, and these clubs are intent on evang evangelizing all children. And um, their sole focus is to recruit, um, proselytize, and um, scare children into. Um, the evangelical faith. They use terms like, you know, they, I mean, they teach things like, you know, you're born of sin and sitters go to hell. And, um, you know, they use a lot of scare tactics, a lot of indoctrination to get these kids into the clubs and to convert. Uh, and a lot of times um, it'll actually be against the teachings that happen in the, in the kid's home. So I'll actually go against, you know, whatever religious teachings or maybe, you know, against religious teachings they're getting uh, at home. Um, but, you know, as we, as, as uh, people with children uh, can tell you, sometimes when it comes to um, after school activities, um, you kind of rely on that extra hour. You have to rely on, on the kids having something to do, um, you know, to give you time to get off of work and, and all those things. Or sometimes, they, you know, they just want to have something to do after school and, and that's fine. Um, but a lot of parents don't want the only option to be this, you know, this um, uh, good news club. So, we decided to offer um, the After School Satan Club, and at these clubs, um, you know, we we don't teach Satanism, we don't uh, teach uh, religion, we don't do anything in that uh, like that. Instead, um, we we have fun. We play puzzles and games, and you know, the things we do focus on scientific literacy. They learn they learn the basics of you know empathy, raising compassion. They learn the the basics of geography and and uh, learning about. Um, you know, learning science things, or sometimes you just have snacks and play board games. It kind of, uh, um, you know, it, it kind of varies, but yeah, it's, it's not indoctrination. Um, they're not being taught religion and, um, you know, it's a good way to, it's, it's a good offering to complement and contrast the, the evangelical uh, programs that currently exist. And the other important thing to note is that we don't offer because we feel like no religion should be in school at all. Uh, we do not after we don't offer after school Satan clubs um, to schools that don't have a currently existing uh, good news club or equivalent. Um, we only offer it to schools that currently have that as a as a um, 
uh, as, a, as an, an alternative for those. Um, so yeah, we have uh, quite a few up in operation. Um, and, um, you know, I, I operated one in Utah for, for a few months, I was able to get it in, you know, like halfway through the school year, and it was a great time, you know, I only had one kid, but you know, we had a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, so it, pertaining to the lawsuit, um, again, because I'm not a lawyer, I can't get into the specifics of the lawsuit. But essentially, what it comes down to is, um, one of the uh, we, we put in an application uh, to have an after school Satan club in one of the in one of the schools and um, uh, the school board, despite the fact that it wasn't actually their decision decided to put uh, kind of make like a, a like a, a clown show of this um, during one of their meetings and put it up to a vote, uh, which isn't actually the process. It's uh, not something that they should have done. They have the authority to do, um, but they just wanted to, uh, they, yeah, they just wanted to make some theater out of it. So yeah, the lawsuit has to do with um, the fact that they did not follow policy. Um, they asserted authority that they don't actually have when it comes to um, us establishing that the after school club. And uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Again, um, the law is on our side. Whether or not uh, this goes before a judge and they decide it is, is entirely different. So yeah, we'll see where that goes. Um, you know, it's a very clear violation of the law, but, um, but yeah. So uh, but yeah, there are others in operation all throughout the all throughout the country. Uh, kids are having a great time. The volunteers are having a great time. And uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been amazing. Um, uh, you know, to see that, to see that program uh, grow, you know, especially since I, I used to be the director and one of the things I kept running into after, um, uh, you have to have an insurance policy um, to, uh, you know, in case you like damage the property, you have to prove that you've got insurance policy and uh, uh, we got dropped by our original insurance carrier and um, nobody would insure us. So um, I had a hard time doing anything for a couple of years because we just couldn't find anything. So um, I decided to focus on other things in TST. So I, I you know, stepped down from the directorship. Um, but now, uh, you know, it's been revitalized. They've been able to figure out the insurance issue. The, the new director is amazing. I can't imagine anyone better, um, you know, putting these into, into the process. Our volunteers are phenomenal. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I, I'm a little giddy um, talking about it because I, I really believe in these clubs. I think they're really great, especially having, you know, done one. Um, and I'm just so happy to see them um, in operation again and, and doing really well. So that's, Wonderful to hear, actually. And yeah. uh, Secular AZ's legal director, Diane, put in the chat, the clubs have to be treated the same, charged the same, child invoked and run, not during any school education time, etc. If you have any clubs at your school that are not following these guidelines, let Secular AZ know about it. Yeah, I'd like to just say that one more time. If there's a club at your school or your kid's school or some school that you know about that is not following these guidelines and treating a religious group differently, etc., let us know. Let Secular AZ yeah. know. Yep. yep. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, let the local uh, Satanic Temple chapter know that uh, maybe uh, maybe we need an after school Satan club here too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing if people go on your website, if they're interested in getting one going, that they'll find the information and the contacts they need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. They can just go to right. satanictemple.com. Uh, it'll be under campaigns. And then you can actually reach out to, um, you know, contact and be like, hey, we have this and this and this. And then uh, uh, one of the volunteers, maybe the director will get back a hold of you and, and start that process. Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Before we go, I just want to note that there's a couple of really great presentations coming up. We have, oh, actually for anyone in Chandler, there's a rally at Chandler City Hall to support student LGBTQ rights. That is at 5 p.m. at the Chandler City Hall. And on Wednesday, the 25th, we have the Peoria Unified School District Governing Board Candidate Forum. We're gonna hear from some people running for board down there. And then on Tuesday, the 31st, we're gonna hear from Chrissy Stroop, who is an author and researcher. Um, she co-edited Empty the Pews. And she does a lot of work on Christian nationalism, and that's going to be very interesting. You can find all of these presentations on our website. And again, Shalise, thank you so much for being here today. That was very interesting. And thank everyone for coming to our presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was wonderful to speak to you all. Thanks. Have a great day. Yeah, you as well.